Father, we, we love you and we thank you for blessing this church with godly men who model what it means to be a, a godly husband and a, a godly father. I thank you for uh, the influence that they have here on the younger men too. And I pray a special blessing upon them today. And I pray, God, that they would enjoy their families, enjoy their children, that they would be honored. And uh, we thank you again for blessing our church with these men. And so we, we love you and we honor you as the perfect father. And we thank you for your kindness and your generosity to us, Lord. We thank you for your patience and the work that you have been and are doing in our lives. We thank you for discipline, Father, when you see fit to administer it. We know that it is perfect and it's because you love us and it's because you are working a good work in our lives. And so we thank you for being such a good father to us all. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, real quick, regeneration. You may have gotten a card as you were coming in. We've been talking about a couple of different ministries that we are going to launch, and one of them is a weekly recovery ministry called Regeneration. It's going to be launching July 11th. I've already mentioned this before, but we want to start putting that in front of you. That is open to the community, to the church, other churches. It's uh, not just for drugs and alcohol. It's any life-dominating issues, and those can be broad. And so uh, we want... Just to put that out there to you, if there's anyone that you know, and I'm sure everyone in this room has somebody on their mind right now that, uh, that struggles in any way, then we would encourage you to invite them. As we said, it's open to the community, and we want to be a, a resource to Napa, and so we're, we're excited about what, the God, what God is going to do through that. Next up, I'm going to call Cassie Joe and Dina Schindler up here, embarrass them just a little bit. Uh, I think most of you in here know them, and they have been such a wonderful gift from God to us for many years. And uh, in my short tenure here, they have uh, blessed me so abundantly, and I, I love them dearly. I know they love me. They love us. And the Lord is taking them to Georgia, and so to uh, a place that is very near and dear to my heart, the, the Dixieland. And so... I'm uh, excited for them and uh, even just a little bit jealous, but you know what? This is my home. God has called the, the Southerner here, and uh, you know, so I, I, there will always be that longing deep within me for old Dixie, but hey, we're excited for you guys. We're thrilled for what God is going to do there, how he's going to use you in, in Georgia, and you get to be near your family, and that is all good, and so we just want to bless you and say that we love you. And we're going to continue to pray for you guys, and we can't wait to hear good reports of what the Lord is doing there for you guys in Georgia. So let's, let's pray for them. Father, we love you, and again, I thank you for Dina and Cassie Joe and the blessing that they have been to so many of us here. And uh, our hearts do hurt, in a sense. This is a sad thing for us, but it's a joyful thing. We're excited about this next chapter for them, and God, so often you bring people into our lives for a time, and we love them while they're here, and then you take them, and they, we love them when they go, Father, and uh, that's the adventure of the Christian life. God, you're always doing new things, and uh, so we just want to support them in that and encourage them in that, so I pray for them, Father. I pray a special blessing upon them and their family, upon all the details that go into making a move like this. We pray for safe travel for them as they go. And as they plug into their new church, God, I pray that they would make new relationships and that they would find their place in the body of Christ there and serve you as faithfully there as they have here. And so we, we honor you, Lord, again, and we commit them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you guys so much. Thank you. We love you. All right, well, you know, over these summer months, there's just been a number of things I've wanted to do uh, differently than, than normal, so we've been having some special services, and you know, we had an ordination service last week, and that went wonderfully, and uh, we're going to have a guest speaker today, and then I'll be back in Acts next week, uh, it's been, seems like forever, but then the very next week, I'll be out again, and uh, uh, the dean of the seminary that I attend in Vallejo is going to be coming, and he's going to share the word of God with us. So I'm very excited, very honored to have that brother here, Todd Bolton, and I know you guys will be totally blessed, and I'm expecting him to give you guys a stellar report of my, uh, my 
my work in class and, and let you know that your, your pastor is an A student and all of that good stuff. So at any rate, um, today we're going to have a special guest speaker, Pastor Mike from Monterey. Uh, you've heard us talk about the bridge, the bridge ministry. A couple weeks back we had a special service there. And we asked you guys to come alongside us and to support us prayerfully, financially, uh, and also once the thing is up and running, there's going to be so many ways in which you can be involved in the bridge, and we're excited about that. Well, I'll just say God has been moving, and He has been providing, and finances have been coming in, and we have a stellar team, and we're going to bring them up at the end of the service and pray over them. I'll have more announcements to make at that time, so I'll save that. But all that to say, God is moving and it's happening way faster than I think we anticipated. And we're really excited, we're really encouraged. And probably one of the biggest things, we've been looking at uh, a number of different houses, but that's, that's a huge part of the, the equation, obviously. Uh, but we want it to be a place where the community is on board and they support the house and the guys in the house. Um, and that, you know, there's all kinds of options out there, but we, we need what God has for us. So we, we ask for you to be praying right now for that part of the ministry. That The house is crucial, and that's, it's a big part of it, and it's a hard part at times to, uh, to figure out how to navigate that. So uh, if there's any one thing that you could be praying for us about with this ministry is, is the house, the location for, for the guys. And so with that, Pastor Mike is going to come up. He was the, uh, you can come on up. He was the, he founded the bridge, and he'll, he'll speak about all of that. But they've really been supporting us. We've been going out to Monterey a number of times now, and uh, he's been such a blessing. And so we asked him to come to share his story, to talk a little bit about the bridge. And um, you know what? I messed up. We're supposed to watch a video. I threw you off. So there, yeah, there's a stool. There's a stool right there. And we're going to watch a video that they put together. It's about a seven-minute video. It's a couple of different testimonies. And really the idea of this is the two people couldn't be more different. And it's amazing how God, how God saves, how God restores uh, in, in, in so many different ways. So it's just two radically different stories just to show the spectrum upon which the gospel works. Amen? And so we'll watch the video, and then Pastor Mike will uh, we'll take it from there. This is Pacific Grove, California, known as America's last hometown. This is our town. And just like so many towns and cities across the country, we now find ourselves in the grip of an opioid crisis. two daughters, Isabella and Josephine. Um, I was married and we had a, what you might say, a normal life. When my youngest daughter, Jo, was born, it was um, a scheduled C-section. It was a horrific C-section and I ended up getting prescribed I look back on it now, a crazy amount of Vicodin, of painkillers. And I took them at the beginning as prescribed and just hit the ground running. I um, moved on to Norco and then to Oxycontin. And then when those didn't, when those were not readily available, I made the switch to heroin. My journey began uh, September 29th, 2017, after a, a long stint in prison, two and a half decades to be exact, and uh, that's when my journey at the bridge started. Uh, 
I was excited, but very, very apprehensive because uh, I thought I would face a lot of stigma because of my time in prison and uh, trying to reassimilate back into society was very intimidating for me. But after my initial interview with Mike, uh, he really, he really settled me down. Uh, he gave me a new enthusiasm to this new chapter in my life. Uh, I didn't know anything about the bridge. I just uh, knew when I applied for transitional housing, it had to be Christian based. And uh, that's why I know God brought me to this place because I didn't know anything about it. And uh, he sent me to a place that welcomed me with open arms, uh, made me feel comfortable, made me feel uh, valued, and made me feel like I was somebody. The best thing that this program offered was time, a safe environment, and this, it just, it gets in you if you let it, and it changes you from the inside out. This is a new lease on life for me, and uh, I think I found my spot. Well, good morning. It's great to be here in Napa. I was hoping for some warm weather, but hey, this is just like home, so that's all right. Um, I want to tell you guys, and I think you probably know what a blessing you have in Pastor Rob and, and Jessica. When I met them at Calvary, uh, um, they were there for a conference, and instantly I was drawn to them. We were like kindred spirits. And one of the things I love the most to say is that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And there are so many pastors that can go their whole entire career and never understand or grasp that concept. But when you have a pastor like Rob and, and his wife, uh, Jessica, that get that right off, I mean, they've been here a short time. And for him to understand that and to grasp that and to that early into his, his time here as senior pastor, to begin to go out and to do something like this in the community is bold, it's brave, and uh, I think that's why I like him so much. He reminds me of a much younger me. Um, so, so if you'd like to, I'd like to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, if you would, if you have a Bible. I just want to share briefly um, out of Nehemiah 2. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, we know that Nehemiah is the cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes. And in, in chapter 1, I'll just paraphrase it, uh, Nehemiah finds out that the town of his ancestors, hometown, has been destroyed. And it repeatedly says that the walls have been broken down and the gates have been burned with fire. And... Uh, Nehemiah is brokenhearted to his core. And there is a four-month time span between Nehemiah 1 and Nehemiah 2. So during that four months, uh, Nehemiah is grieving his town, his hometown. He's grieving, um, in general, he's seeking God. He's asking God what he should do. And... Uh, and that is a man of wisdom. That is a man of God. That is a man that is driven. And the thing about Nehemiah that is so great and interesting is that Nehemiah and Nehemiah 2 is able to do something that is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and we're going to read a little bit of it. But for somebody to do God's work and do it with passion takes a man of passion. It takes somebody who understands and is driven 
So when I look at Pastor Rob and I see what he's doing here, I see a Nehemiah in him. I see a man that is driven, a man that is brokenhearted about what is going on in his own community. When you look around, and we were even, uh, my wife and I drove up to Calistoga yesterday, and, uh, you know, people go there to take mud bath. We did that years ago. We went up to a mud bath. Um, but even yesterday, I noticed in Calistoga, we were spending some time just sitting in a little park, the amount of addicted and homeless people that were congregating in the park. So it, it's, this is an, an epidemic that is happening everywhere, and for the church to turn a blind eye and not address this in a community, it's sad. Um, so I am so proud of Rob and his team that they put together that they are so willing to go out into this community and not always be welcome um, because this is not always a popular thing, right? Let them go somewhere else. Let somebody else take care of them. Let somebody else deal with the problem. But that's not the heart of God, is it? No, it is not. So in Nehemiah 2, it says, In the month of Nisan... In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king, and, had, and, and I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing that you are not sick? And even in that culture, the king was such a, a, a bad dude that he thought that people just being in his presence would make them happy. That's how much the king thought of himself. So for someone to be sad in the presence of the king, you could be put to death for that. You know, you don't want to bum out the king. You know, you're, you're, just because you're in the presence of him, you're supposed to automatically be happy. But he had been with the king for a while, so the king noticed that he was sad and actually thought enough to ask him, why are you sad? You know, are you, you're not sick, obviously, but you are sad. And, um, and uh, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. It was very, and then I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, let the king live forever. So now he's going to suck up a little bit, right? You know, praise the king, let the king live forever. Um, why should not my face be sad when the city of my place of my father's graves lies in ruins, its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king said to me, why are you, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God in heavens and said to the king, if it pleases the king, your servant has found favor in your sight, then send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may, be re that I may rebuild it. So he's going to ask something pretty big of the king. He's going to say, I want you to send me to the community of my, uh, of my ancestors where their graves are. And he's going to be even become even bolder. He's going to say, not only do I want you to send me there, I want you to give me letters so that I may pass through the foreign lands. I want you to provide the timber for me to rebuild when I get there. I also want you to provide me with the people that I need to go there and travel there and to rebuild. And I want you to provide me with the food to do that. And king, guess what? I'm going to build myself a house while I'm there because I'm going to stay there. You know, so he was bold in what he asked of the, of the king, but the king granted the, the, the desires of his heart because what he was doing was, was, a, was a godly act. He wanted to, to help his people out. And so when I heard Pastor Rob talk to you guys earlier, and I know he shared with you a couple of weeks ago, he is boldly coming before you and he is asking you and he is telling you, my heart is burdened. I want you to partner with me. I want you to help me. I want you to come with me. And I want you to help me build a house for those less fortunate. That's what he's asking, amen? And, and he's doing so boldly. I was with him yesterday as we had a neighborhood meeting in a, in a neighborhood that wasn't so excited at all um, to uh, have such an endeavor in their neighborhood. And that's okay. Because when God is in it, and it is God's will and God's desire, you know what? It's going to happen no matter what. And so in, in, in the wisdom that, that Pastor Rob has, he, he asked you the most important thing is for you to folks to come alongside and to pray for that house so that like Nehemiah, so that they go and they can build a community where people can heal. And if you read all through Nehemiah, 
the time they did it in was record time. I think 56 days they went and did that entire work. I could be wrong, so don't, don't hold me to it. If you find the answer after, you can tell me. No, that's all right. Um, but it took a, just a phenomenal record time, which meant that God was in it from the get-go. Because when Nehemiah went before the king and made such a bold request, think about it. You know, go and talk to your boss and say, hey, my dad's house is burnt down. I want you to give me the time off of work, right? Then I want you to give me the money, the transportation, the building materials, the laborers, and then I want you to build a little house for me in the backyard there too so I can stay with him when I help. That is a bold request, but it was granted because Nehemiah spent those months in prayer grieving for the loss. And, um, and I think, I, I guess you all know that Pastor Rob does have a background, and amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord to that. That makes him a man that understands the entire body of Christ. And, uh, and so he is making a very similar request to you folks, and he's saying, I want you to come alongside of me. I want you to come with me. I don't want you just to watch me do it. I want you to help me build this. And I want to tell you that um, um, for Michelle and I, when, uh, when God put it in my heart to open a recovery facility, um, I went to my mentor, his name was Bob Stewart, and I laid the whole thing out. And he said to me, he said, Mike, we need to test and find out if this is from God. So I'm going to ask you to do the impossible. I'm going to ask you, and he grabbed my lips and he pinched them. He said, I want you to shut your mouth and not breathe a word of this to anybody. If your wife confirms this, then it was from God. Like, are you kidding me? Seriously? About a year later, uh, Michelle was leading the children's ministry at the time, and uh, I was walking into the church, and she was uh, coming up the stairs. Our heads passed for like just a split second, and she said, in passing, I think God wants us to open a men's home. I said, what did you say? And she stopped and came back. She said, I, I, I feel that God wants us to open a men's home. And so I'm like, well, okay, well, there's my confirmation. And so I sat down with, we had a transition at the church and Pastor Bill had left and we had a, 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 an interim pastor by the name of Roger Scalise um, come in. And so I was very excited that, that the confirmation had come to me and I sat down with Pastor Roger Scalise and laid this whole thing out. And he just nodded and nodded and nodded. And I said, so what do you think? You know, I was expecting this, right? How can I help you? What do you need? How can we get on board? He looked at me and said, well, Mike, I think that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard of in my life. Um, <laughs> so I, I got up and, you know, he prayed and I walked out and Michelle was waiting for me outside in the office. She said, well, what did Roger say? I said, Roger said he thought it was the greatest idea he's ever heard. Um, so I guess that's what you call a Christian lie, right? Um, but because God was in it, things moved very quickly. Um, we, we, we formed our own 501c3. We started much like you guys are very, very quickly. And about six months later, Roger called me back into the office. He said, I know it was harsh a long time ago, but I see that God is blessing the bridge. Can, can we have the bridge back? I said, no. <laughs> it's mine, and I want it. Um, so, um, but, you know, God just began to bless the ministry. And I think we have, a, you know, Michelle and I, we thought if we could have two people living in a recovery home, that we would be thrilled, that we would know that God was blessing. I think we have a slide to show our current... Um, um, so that is just some of the folks. We currently house 34 men and women. And so God has blessed it abundantly. And, uh, and I want to share a little bit. I got to, we were at the hotel that you guys blessed us with. And this morning I was sitting in the hot tub just having some quiet time. And I got a phone call from my daughter, Sarah. Um, and she was singing Happy Father's Day to you and my two granddaughters were in the background kind of going along with her. And uh, um, how, many of you, how many of you folks in here have kids? Quite a few. All right. So um, when your kids do well in school and when they get an A on their paper, are you proud? Yes? Okay. 
So I want to share a paper that my daughter, Sarah, who called me this morning, she didn't share it with me until much, much later. Um, but this is a, a paper that she did for her English class that she got an A on. Very proud of her for that. But as I read through it, it just, it, it, and I have a hard time reading it, it broke my heart. So I'm going to share it with you guys this morning and then give you just a little bit of background of me and then... Uh, um, so my daughter Sarah was asked to, to write a paper, paper called Moment of Power. And uh, so she did. She wrote, my moment of power occurred when I was a sophomore in high school. I was sitting on the counter in the bathroom putting on my makeup as I did every morning while getting ready for school. I looked over to see my stepdad standing at the doorway. He had come to deliver bad news. Your dad has suffered a major stroke, he told me. I replied, okay, thank you, I understand. I didn't know what else to say. I didn't begin crying, nor did I panic. I just wanted to be alone, to reflect on what I had just been told. It was weird to hear from one dad that your other dad might die. I didn't even know what a stroke was exactly. But I knew it was life-threatening, and I also knew that there was nothing much I could do. I felt powerless. I hated the thought of staying home with my family worrying, so I wanted to go to be around my friends at school and to pretend that it was a normal day. Um, my mom said that she would call me with an update on my dad's condition, so my older brother and I went to school and attempted a normal day. It was almost lunchtime when my principal pulled me and my brother out of class into his office. We knew it couldn't be good news. I was nervous as we sat in the chair across from Mr. Joannes. He told us he had spoken to my mom and the doctors expected my father to die within hours. Um, by the time my mom picked us up, I was numb. The thought of my dad dying was surreal and couldn't even sink in. I felt more, even more powerless. The hospital was in Salinas. It was at least 30 minutes away, but it seemed much longer. My dad had been there for two weeks prior as a result of his years-long heroin addiction that caused him to develop a skin-eating bacteria from repetitive use of needles. During his treatment, he suffered a major setback that led to a stroke. As I was driving in the car anticipating what I would see, somehow I knew this wasn't the end for my dad. It couldn't be. He couldn't die because my prayers for him had not yet been answered. My prayers were that my dad... Mm, sorry. Life would change no matter what it took. I prayed that very thing almost as long as I could remember. Although I may not have felt it at the time, but I knew there was power in prayer. My father's story of addiction is similar to many others. He was a successful firefighter paramedic, saving lives of others. His marriage with my mother thrived and, he, and all was well, but by the time he was given a death sentence by the doctors, his addiction had stripped him of job, money, marriage, and now he was about to lose it all. It was awful. I prayed for him for so many years because I needed my dad to change for us. At the hospital, my father was unrecognizable. He looked like the same man, but it wasn't him. The stroke left him unable to read, write, speak, tell time, the doctor said that if by some miracle he did make it through the night, he would never be able to do any of those things again. Saying goodbye to my dad was not really possible because he didn't even know that I was there. As I sat in the waiting room, I felt nothing. I couldn't even cry because I refused um, because I refused to believe that this was the end. Despite the doctor's prognosis, my dad did make it through the night. One day became a week, then a week became a month. He never died. Uh, by the time I uh, went to visit my father in the hospital, he, had, he was beginning to recover. I had my first conversation with him since the stroke. I realized that my prayers had been answered. He was sitting there in the hospital bed. Uh, I was talking with my dad, and he was talking to me. My, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I had my power moment because my dad could talk to me and my prayers had been answered. The extent of my power moment reaches far beyond that conversation and con continues to this day. My dad now leads a recovery ministry for men and women that also struggle, struggle with life-dominating addictions. He has, also, he has cha indeed changed and um, 
uh, indeed a changed man and fully functioning member of our society. My prayer was that God would save my dad and bring him back to me. In my desperation to see my dad better, I was powerless. However, um, I saw with my own eyes the power of prayer and learned from that day forth that there was nothing that prayer can't help with. Um, Sarah. And, uh, and so I, I, I think people that have addictions don't realize how that they affect their families. You know, I, I never knew all of these things. I never knew the extent of harm I was causing. You know, my wife, Michelle, and I, we have four children. I, I never even considered that. And so there are so many families that are broken every year by addiction. You saw some of the, some of the statistics um, on the screen, the, the cost to uh, the economy, the cost to families, the cost to our community. And so the thought of the bridge expanding into Napa for us is very exciting. But there will be, there will be warfare, like David Guzik says uh, when he's talking about Nehemiah. Notice when the opposition came, not at the heart stage, nor at the vision stage, nor at the prayer stage, nor at the planning stage, but when progress came in doing that is when opposition came, you know. Sometimes when we start actually doing what we're doing, that's when the opposition comes. And, um, and, and being with Rob and Jess and the, and the team that they have has just been, it's a blessing for Michelle and I, knowing that the suffering that our family had gone through is able to help other families out and able to help other people out so that everybody doesn't have to continue to go through this cycle. You know, I, I love to talk to people all the time. They, um, I have a much different view on addiction than a lot of people. You know, people say it's generational, and then I take them to Exodus 20. Um, it says the sins of the father are, are, are put upon the second and third generation. It goes on to say for those who don't love Jesus. For those who don't love Jesus. So what that tells me is that what can break what people call a generational curse or a, or a lifestyle or a family thing. You know, well, I drank because my dad drank and his dad drank and, he, and it's just the way it is. You know, that's not always true, you know. But what you can say and what the Bible does talk about is when Jesus gets involved, all that changes. It's a game changer, you know. I see people all the time go through program after pro I went through four programs myself. Um, and the only way that I changed was Jesus had to come in and change me. You know, you, uh, you can tell by my daughter's uh, story that I suffered a, a massive stroke, was in a coma for a while. You know, it was funny because I prayed for God to deliver me from heroin addiction, and he did. Um, when I woke up from a coma, I was no longer a drug addict. It was kind of nice. Um, I also couldn't walk or talk or read or write or do any of those things, um, but that was just kind of the thing that went along with it. But it was a blessing. You know, Paul talks in Scripture about, you know, and many times asks God if you will, uh, you will remove this thorn in my flesh. I think sometimes that God puts a thorn in our flesh to remind us of where we came from and, and who's in charge and how we're to act and how we're to react and what we're to do with what God has given us, you know. So the way I look at it, that God took away everything that I had. He took away my ability to walk, talk, read, write. Um, by the time I realized what had happened to me, the doctor came in and sat with me and my family and told me that I would never walk again, I would never drive, um, I would never work. Um, they asked me to come up with three goals. Um, so I said, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna walk, I wanna run, and I wanna work. And, uh, and so uh, I don't remember if Michelle was there with me or not, I think she was. So I told him these three goals and then about a half hour later, the doctor came in with another doctor and introduced me to the psychiatrist and gave me a little cup of pills. And they said, well, what is? I said, well, what is this? And they said, they're antidepressants. I said, for what? Well, when you, because you're, the things you're saying you were going to do are not possible. None of them are possible. You will not ever walk again. You will never work again. You will never run again. You will never drive again. What you got is what you got. So, we want you to be able to cope with the fact that you're stuck with what you got, buddy. Um, and it's funny, and I, and I love this. Um, um, I was actually transferred from the hospital to a rehab facility where I was supposed to spend six months learning how to possibly walk. Um, um, the doctor there interviewed me, and it's in, it was in my hospital records that we got years later. And I said, Mr. Casey is under the impression that his, his faith in his church family will enable him to 
walk and work. Um, he believes that, that, that he can make that connection and these things will happen for him. And then they went on to give their clinical diagnosis about, eh, it's not going to happen. Um, so I was, supposed to, I was scheduled to be there for six months. Um, on uh, the morning of day 12, um, I called Michelle. And you have to understand, I was, uh, after you have a stroke, you're very confused. I called Michelle on day 12 and I said, honey, they're discharging me. She said, oh, honey, you know, you're, you're confused. No, I'll call the doctor later, and I'll talk to the doctor. And uh, so she did. Um, I said, go ahead. So she did. She called the doctor and then um, called me back and said, hey, you're right. So by day 12, I was walking, and they were going to discharge me. And the, the beauty was um, one of the physical therapists came in who was a believer, and he said, we have this lady that has been here for about six and a half months, who had the same exact stroke you had, but she's made zero progress. So will you go and share your faith with her? Um, and I did. They took me to her room. I shared my faith with her. She wasn't open to faith, uh, but when I left, she was still there. Um, and so it was amazing for some of the clinicians and some of the doctors to say, this guy has some faith, and these two people had the same prognosis. She's been here for six and a half months, and She's, nothing's happening for her, but this guy has this faith thing, and, uh, and now he's walking, and we're discharging him. And uh, so we're not limited by what man tells us. We're only limited by God. And uh, if God has something in his plans, then God will see that happen. And I believe that with Pastor Rob and, and Jessica and this awesome ministry team that you guys have, I mean, I'm so excited to be here. I wish I told Michelle, I want to move down here and, and be a part of this because this is exciting because ours actually started uh, 14 years ago, and uh, um, not that we're not blessed and we don't love it, but I'm so excited because this is the passion that God has given me and put on my heart. Um, it's like, I, I mean, I just want to be a part of it. Uh, so I told uh, Pastor Rob that um, I would commit to coming up um, pretty regularly and, 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 and getting in as involved as I can or as involved as I'm able um, 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 and being on the front end of what you guys are doing here because it's really exciting. God's hand is on it. I can tell you that just seeing what's happening so far. Um, God's hand is absolutely on this, and I'm excited for you guys of what's going to happen, what God's going to do here, and what Pastor Rob is going to do here. I, I, I think he's going to bring this church into a whole new realm of serving and helping those that really need help. Amen. You want to come on up, Pastor Rob? Mm. I like that. Hey, you want to come on up? Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you so much, Pastor Mike. I really appreciate those words of encouragement and affirmation. And they have been such a support to us. And as we've gone out there and scouted the ministry and spent time there, they've really blessed us and invested in what's happening here. And so we want to bring the team up. Our team, Pastor Gordon and Shelly and Aaron and Jackie Mosley, you guys want to come on up Jessica would you come up babe and um, Connie Opus is a part of this but she's in Ukraine and I was uh, supposed to tell you guys that the team in Ukraine says hello and that God's blessing their trip and so blessings they're not here but um, so this is the team and I also wanted to make an announcement about the Mosleys as you guys know I mean they've been in this church for many many years and God called them about a year ago to to Mexico and they were there uh, for a good season and God just really man sort of breaking on them big time you know and and God does that you know the Bible says it's doubtful that God will use a man greatly until he's wounded him deeply and uh, for any of us in ministry we know that uh, we're, we're baptized into it through suffering and and just being broken and that's so necessary and so God did that we all know what a hard time it was for them in Mexico and McKenna had a hundred and seven degree fever and uh, you guys know what, what that generally means when that happens. And so it's amazing what God did in their family and their lives. And it became very clear that they were to come back, but they weren't sure where. So then they went up to, uh, to Oregon for a little bit of time to help Pastor Adam and, and just waiting on the, the next steps from the Lord. And it, it was on my heart. I reached out to them and said, guys, we, we, we want you here, you know, and we believe God's called you to be here. And we want them to be a part of this bridge ministry. So they began to pray and seek the Lord. And God spoke to them and made it very clear that they were indeed to come back. And so now they're here. And we're getting ready to ordain Aaron as Pastor Aaron of the bridge here next month. So, yeah. 
And so Pastor Gordon and soon to be Pastor Aaron, they will be kind of the heads of the bridge ministry, and that is going to be a local missions endeavor of the church. So we're going to, our church will support the bridge, and they will continue on as missionaries in Napa, local missionaries to the bridge, to that endeavor. And so uh, I think a number of you here may, may support the Mosleys um, as missionaries. We want to encourage you to continue to do that. If anybody else feels led of the Lord, they are supported by our church. Uh, we have a number of missionaries that we, we give to financially, and uh, they, they are in that group. And we want to continue to, to do that because they are serving as missionaries here in our community. And that's, that's where it starts, right? In our backyard and then around the nation and then ultimately around the world. But this is a real issue in our backyard, and we want to do something about it. We want to be on the front end of this thing. And so now we have Gordon and Shelly, and Shelly's handling a lot of the technical, financial, paperwork stuff. She's our, I often say she's our secret weapon in, in the group, and it's amazing. We couldn't do this without her. And Jackie and Aaron, and uh, you know, with Aaron's law enforcement expertise and all his networking that he can do for us on that to that end. And Pastor Gordon has been so faithful in this church over the years and, and to the Napa State Hospital ministering to the criminally insane. I mean, that's, that's heavy. And so we just have a really awesome team that God has brought together. And as I said, the funds have started to come in. And, and so we uh, just want you to know that and be praying for us. And if you want to, to support this ministry financially, we, we would ask you to do that. We're working towards having other churches come alongside, and, and I think that is happening. Um, and it will, as time goes on, we're applying for grants. We're doing everything that we can. Because ultimately, you don't want to have to charge the people to come into a program like this. They don't have money, and they've burned so many bridges, and their families have helped them so many times over. Usually by the time they, they come to this point, that there's, there is no options for them. And so freely we have received, freely we will we'll, we'll what? Give. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do. So I asked Pastor Mike if he would pray for us, pray over the bridge ministry, pray for the team. And, uh, and what God is, is going to do. So I would ask you to, uh, to join with us as he, as he prays. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, so much. Lord, for the, the burden that you put in my heart so many, many years ago, Lord. I thank you for the burden that you're putting in the heart of Calvary Napa, Lord, the leadership team. Lord, I just thank you for what you're going to do here, the lives you're going to bless, the community you're going to bless, the families, or the families that you are going to bless, Lord. And I just, Lord, ask you to um, prayerfully with this congregation, Lord, just pray for each and every person upon the stage, Lord, to, that you would place a hedge of protection around their families, Lord, their marriages, them personally, Lord. They would continue to walk and work with integrity, Lord. And uh, Lord, as I said, said uh, um, so many times the battle comes when things seem to be going smoothly, Lord. So we just pray for the team here, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in this church, this community, Lord. Thank you for the hearts of the pastors on staff here, Lord. And just uh, we in Monterey, Lord, come alongside them as well prayerfully. And uh, Lord, pray for this great work that you're going to do here, Lord. We thank you for the ordination that's going to happen next weekend, Lord. What a blessing that will be, Lord, how you truly use your people to do your work and your will, Lord. So we thank you. We praise you, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the faithful. And Lord, we praise you. We love you. And Lord, um, how appropriately fitting is that it's Father's Day. This is your day, Lord. Um, that we thank you so much for all that you do. And we, we just praise you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.